Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we rip, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month on up as high as you want and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there and uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood, by Landon Turner. Chapter 9 Nick flung open the door to the shepherd home and slammed it shut, locking it behind him. He caught his breath, shutting his eyes tightly, trying to force the ghastly side of Eddie's body from his mind. God, how many more of them were dead, he thought slaughtered, just like his cousin. God, poor Michael. There had to be someone else alive. It couldn't be just himself and Tina up against a psychopath. No time for thinking, he decided. Tina! He called into the shepherd house. The couch where Tina had been sitting, waiting for him to get back, was vacant. Tina? There was no answer. Damn it, Nick thought to himself. I told her to stay here. He ran halfway up the staircase. Tina! No answer. Nick felt his breath intensify. He pulled out the gun and held it up. Tina? He stammered. What if Jason had gotten her too? What if now he was all alone out at Crystal Lake? Just then, the door to the small bathroom off of the living room opened. Nick whirled around and aimed the gun at whoever was now stepping out of the bathroom. It was Melissa, who recoiled with shock at the sight of the Smith & Wesson aimed at her head. Jesus Christ, she exclaimed. Nick relaxed, heaved a sigh of relief, and lowered his weapon. Where is Tina? Melissa scoffed. A psych ward? How should I know? I do not have time for your bullshit, Melissa, Nick thought. Eddie's dead, Nick said grimly. Melissa snickered with disdain. What? He's dead. Michael's dead too. I saw him. Melissa laughed but her smile faded when she saw the abject seriousness in Nick's piercing stare. She still was in disbelief. Get real, she scoffed. Just don't go back to that house, Melissa. Melissa started to spout off some snarky comeback, but the tears that were welling up in Nick's eyes made her think otherwise. She hesitated. Okay, fine. But where was Tina? was screaming now. Dark clouds obscured the full moon. Tina was frantically moving through the dark thicket of gnarled trees in front of her. Mom! She screamed. 
All she heard was the screeching of the dry storm around her that scattered the dead leaves. Thunder growled. Where could they have gone? God damn it, she thought. I never should have taken the car. Now her mother was somewhere out there with a mad killer on the loose. With that thought, Tina decided there and then to just keep quiet and keep searching. But by now, her mother was probably already dead at the hands of Jason Voorhees. And it had all been Tina's fault. But how could she have known that a dead serial killer was at the bottom of that lake? How could she have known the true gravity of her powers? But that didn't matter. She had to be sure that her mother was truly gone. But in the pit of her stomach, she knew the awful truth. After all, Michael was dead and her vision had come true then. Tina! A frantic voice rang out in a strained whisper. Tina whipped around to see Dr. Crew standing behind a thicket of gnarled branches and thorns. Shh! Dr. Cruz urged her, bringing his finger up to his lips. You have to come back with me right now. What are you doing here? Where's my mother? Tina cried. She's, um, she's back at the house. Come with me, please. Tina shook her head. You're lying, she exclaimed. Tina, I am not lying. You're lying. I was just there. Dr. Cruz came out from behind the thicket and extended his arm to her. Tina tried to run in the opposite direction, but Dr. Cruz lunged at her, snatching her fiercely by her jacket. Tina cried out in pain. Let go of me! Tina, please, Dr. Cruz said. I said come back with me, damn it! And then, the moonlight hit Dr. Cruz just right, enough for Tina to see him clearly. Tina's eyes widened as she saw the splattered redness around his collar and on his neck. Blood? She said in knowing terror. What happened? Where is my mother? She's... she's gone, said Dr. Cruz hesitantly, lowering his voice solemnly. Tina shook her head in disbelief. No, she declared firmly. Then she took off into the thicket where Dr. Cruz had last seen the masked murderer. No, Tina, don't go that way, Tina! She wasn't listening. Now she was gone, her form disappearing into the darkness. The stark realization that he was now alone hit him, and he glanced around fearfully. God, I never should have come out here, he thought. I should have done more research about Crystal Lake, his mind screamed. Maybe Tina's powers and the man that Tina had brought out of the lake were connected. Crystal Lake had to be cursed. Look at what happens around here, he thought. Girls are born with incredible powers and serial killers prowl the woods. If he would have just looked into the evident dark and macabre history that this location had, he might not have brought them all out here. Now he was in the middle of it. Which way to run? There was nowhere to run. More than that, he didn't know which direction to run. He whirled around, doing a full 180, getting disoriented. Everything around him looked the same. Just vast swaths of thicket and dark woods all around him on either side. Dr. Cruz started running, stumbling through the foliage in the opposite direction of where Tina had gone. He fell against a tree, catching himself from pitching forward into a ravine. Suddenly, the still silence was thwarted by a strange sound. Dr. Cruz didn't recognize it at first. He knew he had heard something, something loud and raucous, but he couldn't identify it or where it was coming from. He whirled around and then again, searching for the source of the strange noise. There it was again. He quickened his breath, looking in all directions. Now it was unmistakable. It was the revving of the engine of a power toll of some sort. Jason stepped out from behind a tree in all his humongous infamy. In his hands was a long electric tree trimmer, affixed with a spinning circular blade. Jason tugged at the string and the blade whizzed to life, coming straight for Dr. Cruz as he cried out in absolute horror. His eyes were riveted on the spinning blades that could easily tear into him if they came close enough. Cruz staggered backwards, yelping again as he lost his footing, sprawling into the leaves. 
Jason advanced, not wasting any time. Cruz got to his feet and ran blindly, crashing through the undergrowth like a bull in a china shop, not sure which direction he was even going or where this tangled path of briars would lead him, but that was the last thing on his panicked mind. All he could think about was the spinning blade, and the way Mrs. Shepard had howled at the sky as hot blood sprayed all across the front of his blazer. My God, he thought, what have I put myself into? This can't be happening. He still heard the hum of the tremor behind him, but he didn't dare look back. Oddly, as fast as he ran through the undergrowth, the tree tremor stayed at the same volume. It was as if all his running were for nothing. Jason was still right behind him, walking at an even pace. Eventually, the tree tremor noise started to fade as Dr. Cruz maneuvered his way down another hill. Finally, he stopped. He couldn't hear anything now. Just his own frenetic and labored breathing and his pounding heart that pulsated in his ears. Where the fuck was he? Nowhere. Like a ghost, he had vanished. Dr. Cruz spun around, tripping, crawling through the leaves on all fours and then staggering to his feet doing another 180. Jason was gone. I lost him, Cruz thought with relief. God damn, I lost him. Now what? He was probably more lost than before in these dense woods. How far do they go? Where would they take him? Snap. A twig. There, behind him. Cruz didn't have time to react. He spun around and gasped at the monstrous hand that palmed his midriff with immense force, sending him somersaulting backwards down the wooded hillside. He felt searing pain coursing through his lower body as he realized something was badly injured. He rolled around like a fish out of water in the leaves as Jason chugged the tree trimmer to life once again, and the spinning blades came at him, gleaming in the light of the moon that wavered in and out as clouds drifted across the night sky. The tree trimmer was deafening now. Dr. Cruz was valiantly struggling to get to his feet, but it was of no use. His legs were barely functional. He crawled backwards, his eyes filled with terror at the tree tremor looming over him like a mark of death. The spinning blades of death tore into him and Dr. Cruz let out a gut-wrenching scream that mingled with the sound of the engine and the tearing of tissue and flesh. The blade slashed into his belly and his hands went instinctively to the wound. He looked down in horror at his own intestines leaking out of the gaping incision in his torso. He screamed again as Jason kept trimming, and then all was silent as the tree trimmer's motor came to a stop. Mom! Tina's anguished voice rang out. Moving through the dense thicket, she had seen something lying in the leaves. Splotches of white and red peeked at her through the branches. It was her mother. Her hands folded over her stomach peacefully. Her eyes closed as if she had laid there and accepted her death. Her torso was marked by a giant red stain. Tina yelled no and knelt down and cradled her lifeless mother in her arms. Tears leaked from her eyes as she wailed again. Mama! Mama, oh God! Tina laid her mother back to rest in the leaves and got to her feet. Instantly, her mind snapped back to survivor mode. Her mother was dead, just like her father. No use in dwelling on it now. She started again through the dense woods, blocking the horrible sight of her murdered caregiver from her mind. After a few minutes of running and crying, Tina broke out of the shelter of the trees. She could see the house in the distance across the clearing. She moved through a grove of trees when suddenly she caught a glimpse of a flash of yellow out of the corner of her eyes. Running closer, she saw someone sitting in a tree. Her long black hair was fanned out around her head and she had her back to Tina. Kate, Tina said instinctively. Kate? Tina ran towards Kate and spun her around. Tina froze with fright. Kate had been propped up in the tree like a doll being shoved into a cabinet, folded up inside the branches. The party horn protruded from one of her eyes. 
Her other eye was completely lifeless and glassed over. Tina backed up, recoiling with the shock of it all and bumped into something, or as it turned out, someone. It was Sandra, lying naked, covered in mud and algae from head to toe. Oh my God, she thought, they're all... And then she saw Maddie, the most hideous sight of all. Her throat was a bleeding, gaping mess. Two nails that affixed her to the tree she was hanging from protruded from each of her wrists. Snap! A rope broke above Tina's head, and Russell's body came plummeting down, stopping short, dangling upside down by his feet like a freshly slaughtered lamb. Tina finally unleashed a hellish scream, turned and ran out of the grove, approaching the rental cabin. She was almost there. She started down the dirt path. As her eyes adjusted, she froze. There in the path, it was him. A rusty chain dangled around his neck. A hockey mask was on his face. His shoulders rose as he took in a ragged breath and laser-focused his eyes on Tina, sensing something different about her. Jason cocked his head. He was keen on her every move and every glance. But something nagged at him. He could sense it deep within him that this one would be a fighter. Tina locked eyes with him, froze in a stupor of fascination and in sheer terror. Jason? She stammered in disbelief. Jason stood there, his shoulders rising and falling slowly. He didn't move. There was a murky puddle of water in between them. And then Tina felt it. As she wiped a tear, she suddenly felt what she had been hiding from for years. It was her talents. But this time she knew she couldn't resist them. She had to give in. It seemed to rise up from the soles of her feet. A well of power, a force, ripples of shock waves that began to ricochet inside her until suddenly they eased and smoothed out. Tina felt everything lock into place. Only one thing to do now. She was in control. Her eyes flickered to the ground, searching for anything she could use against him. Nothing but leaves. But what was underground? Out of nowhere, the ground began to shake. Jason almost lost his footing. He showed a semblance of human emotion as he glanced around in bewilderment at what was happening. Then, one by one, roots from the nearby pine trees started unearthing, unraveling from the soil and wrapping themselves into long tendrils. Jason just watched. The tendrils shot out like bony fingers, wrapping around Jason's ankles and pulling him into the puddle with a splash. Now was Tina's chance. There was a power pole nearby. Her eyes locked on it like two laser beams. Wires suddenly snapped from the pole, sending a shower of sparks in all directions. The wires fell, and as Jason struggled to his feet, Tina mustered up every bit of willpower and concentrated with all of her might on only one of the wires. Come on, she thought. Control, Dr. Cruz's voice echoed in her mind. For once, the bastard had helped her, and it looked like his urging was finally paying off. The wire suddenly came to life like a wriggling cobra as Tina focused on it, allowing the raw terror inside her to bubble up. The wire snaked over to the puddle, slipping onto the murky water, and just like that, Jason began to convulse. The electricity rocketed through him as Tina stood like a statue, her face red, her fist clenched, glaring at Jason with hatred. One last shockwave ravaged him, and then down he fell like a tree into the shallow puddle. Tina relaxed, and every muscle in her body released. Fucking finally, she thought. They finally came in handy for once. But he wasn't dead. Jason shot to his feet like lightning, resulting in a shriek from Tina. How was he still alive? Tina's mind screamed, My God, he's unstoppable! Tina sprinted for the first place she saw, the rental house. Maybe someone was left alive. Two against one would be better than just her against Jason. She did have her powers, but she didn't know how much longer she could stay in control. She couldn't just rely on them. She had to find Nick. Tina ran up the steps to the back door and threw it open into the kitchen, slamming it closed and locking it. Nick! She cried helplessly. There was no answer. The house was dark and deathly silent. 
There was no more life, no more party, just silence now. She backed away from the door, trying to stop her entire body from quivering. There were hardly any tears left. Lightning flashed outside, illuminating the kitchen in incandescent light. The dry storm howled as the wind made the old cabin groan and shift. The house finally settled. Tina backed into the kitchen island, her hands scrabbling over the top of the counter for any kind of weapon. What would she possibly use against him? He was seven fucking feet tall. One of the knives on the counter would hardly phase him. This killer, this Jason Voorhees, was seemingly unstoppable. And I brought him back, Tina thought. I fucking brought him back. God, what have I done? Lightning struck again and Tina winced, glancing around in all directions. Everything was quiet now. Like a SWAT team member, Jason suddenly came catapulting through the large kitchen window in a spray of fragmented glass. Tina screamed bloody murder. Now he stood in the kitchen with her as lightning rang out again, illuminating him in white light. He stank of filth. It was nauseating. His hockey mask was held on by a strap that had become embedded in his rotted flesh. Tina stared at him in a mix of astonishment and terror. He was so fucking massive. Tina had to fight at a distance. It was her only chance. Oh God, where the fuck was Nick? Tina made a mad dash for the living room, running through the sliding doors, and then she turned to stare at them. She again concentrated intensely on the sliding doors, and they slammed closed of their own volition. Tina shut her eyes, feeling the energy radiating off of her like heat waves. The dining table, as if it had taken on a life of its own, slid across the kitchen floor, barricading it and blocking the doors from Jason. Jason cocked his head like a confused dog, he stepped forward in one huge bound, flipped the table in one sweep, and then flung open the sliding doors. His shoulders lowered as he let out another ragged breath. Now he was just pissed off. Tina was one of them to Jason, and now she was destroying his entire world. Jason knew in a rudimentary yet thorough way how the world worked. He knew the basic physics of things. After all, he had survived off pure instinct for as long as he could remember. But this girl was completely taking that from him, and it made him incredibly angry. Angrier than before. Angrier than ever. Tina's teary eyes flickered intensely over to the object immediately to her right, the couch. It levitated as Tina focused hard. Her emotional state was still perfectly at the right level. Then the couch soared across the room and Jason was so stunned he couldn't get out of the way. Like a torpedo, it rammed him, sending him flying back into the kitchen. Tina released, gasping for air, feeling her muscles relax as she stumbled backwards onto the floor. Jason heaved the couch off of him and jolted upright to his feet, glaring at Tina. Tina Crab walked backwards away from him across the floor as he outstretched his arms and lunged at her, growling maniacally. Her hand felt something cold and clammy. She turned to see what it was that she was touching and recoiled with disgust and terror. It was Eddie, the rider, but he was nothing now. His severed head had been stuffed into a potted plant. His mouth hung open and his glassy eyes were staring up at her. As Jason came at her, Tina focused on the plant and it lifted, striking Jason and sending him stumbling back again. This was Tina's chance. She bolted out the front door and ran out onto the path, turning around to face the cabin. Jason almost ripped the front door off its hinges as he yanked it open and stepped out onto the wooden porch. The wood sagged underneath his massive weight. He still kept coming. Nothing was working. Tina had to think fast. Jason cocked his head at her. He didn't know what to make of her, and it was consuming him with unadulterated rage. He studied her for a brief second, waiting to see what her next move would be. Jason inched closer cautiously, still on the porch and under the massive roof that overhung it. Tina had an idea. She focused all of her emotions on the wooden beams that held up the porch roof. And then, to her surprise, one of them suddenly snapped like a pencil. Jason recoiled with shock, jumping back almost like a frightened animal. 
He watched as another column snapped as easily as chalk. Tina's entire body locked. Three more columns snapped. Her eyes flickered downwards. Then, the entire porch roof caved in on top of Jason with one resounding crash. Nick and Melissa both jerked their heads to the door at the sound of the porch roof caving in next door. They ran into the living room as the door to the shepherd house opened, and a crying Tina ran inside and closed the door behind her. Tina! Nick exclaimed. He scanned her up and down, seeing how filthy and caked with mud she was. Tina looked up at Nick with teary, bloodshot eyes. My, my mom, she said, her voice breaking. He... I got my mom. Who? I killed him. Jason's dead, she said. Shh, shh, it's okay, Nick said, as Tina fell into his arms. He guided her over to the couch and set her down. Melissa's hands fell down by her side and she scoffed. All right, what's going on, she demanded. Tina didn't say a word. She wiped tears away, resting her head on Nick's shoulder. Melissa... Someone is out there. He's killed Michael and Eddie, Nick said. Melissa rolled her eyes. You're nuts, she spat at him. Both of you. Shut up, Melissa, Nick said, getting more agitated by her the longer that she was in the room with them. Melissa shook her head, scoffing again. I don't believe you. You people give me the creeps. She turned to walk to the front door. Nick shot upright. Where do you think you're going? Melissa spun around. I'm going to bed. You want to come? She snapped snarkily. Then she reached for the door. Don't go out there, Melissa, Nick shouted. Melissa whirled around sharply. Fuck you. Yeah, fuck you both. She opened the door and her jaw dropped. Jason was standing on the porch. Tina shrieked and leaped up off the couch like a cat, seeing a growling Rottweiler. Melissa couldn't believe her eyes and couldn't move. In front of her was a huge, rotting man in a decrepit old hockey mask. In his right hand was the axe from the woodpile. She didn't run. She didn't scream. Her mouth hung open in shock. Tina and Nick just stood, frozen with fright. All they could do was watch as Jason slowly raised the axe. Melissa couldn't even get out of the way. She was paralyzed. Time seemed to slow down as the blade of the axe sliced into her pretty face. Tina screamed again, and Nick's eyes grew wide as Jason snatched Melissa's blonde hair and tossed her across the room like she was a rag doll. Tina, run! Nick bellowed. Tina cried out in terror and made a mad dash for the open front door, but Jason rushed the door in one step, slamming it closed. Nick yanked Tina towards the kitchen, but Jason blocked them off again. Go! Go! Nick cried. He pulled Tina to the opposite side of the room and yanked her up the stairs. Jason lashed out at Nick, grabbing his jacket in a vice-like grip. His denim jacket ripped, and they both made it up the stairs just out of Jason's grasp. They reached the upstairs hallway and scrambled into Dr. Cruz's office. The window, Nick proclaimed. He ran towards it, sliding it open and stepping out onto the roof. He turned to see that Tina wasn't in the office with him. Tina, he called. No answer. Nick went back out into the hallway and saw a terrifying sight. Jason was walking slowly and menacingly up the stairs. Tina stood in the hallway, frozen in time, her fists clenched by her side. Her eyes were transfixed on the mass killer. Her face flushed red. Tina? Nick said. Tina didn't respond or look at him. She remained facing Jason. Her eyes flickered up to the ceiling, aiming at a circular decorative ceiling light. The decorative light that hung from the ceiling by a cord started shaking. 
Then it swung like a pendulum, slowly gaining momentum as Jason came closer. As Jason climbed to the next step, he looked up. He never knew what hit him. The decorative light swung towards him and shattered against his mask. Jason let out a pained groan and toppled backwards, plunging and splintering through the old wooden staircase and disappearing into a void of darkness. Tina released, her entire body relaxing, and she fell to her knees with a sob. Nick bent down and helped her to her feet, his eyes looking down at the hole in the stairs where Jason had fallen through. There was no way he was dead, but maybe this would give them enough time to get one of the cars and get the fuck out of Crystal Lake. They crept towards the top of the stairs. There was silence. Jason didn't appear up through the hole, but it was too dark to see down into the space underneath the stairs. Come on, Nick said to Tina as she trembled in his arms. He made his way down the first few steps and then balanced on the frame of what was left of the staircase, maneuvering his way around the hole. Tina came down the same way, taking Nick's hand and skirting around the hole timidly. They made it down, but as they went for the front door, the living room wall imploded outwards and Jason came barreling out from under the stairs like an enraged bull. Tina unleashed another piercing scream. Nick started to pull her towards the door, but Jason was far too quick. He grabbed Nick by both his shoulders and heaved him into the wall. His head struck the plaster, and like that, he was down. No! cried Tina. Jason advanced towards Nick's unconscious form, raising his heavy boot and getting ready to slam it down on Nick's head. Jason suddenly froze. He brought his hands up to his head. Something was happening. The strap of the mask on his head was getting tighter and tighter. Blood and brain matter seeped out from underneath the strap as it pulled increasingly tighter by the power of forces that were making Jason increasingly angry. Then the mask snapped off, and Jason spun around to face Tina. Tina was standing there, her fist clenched, her eyes locked on Jason. As she saw what had been under that hockey mask, she recoiled, bringing her hands up to her face. His teeth were nothing but rotted fragments. Fish had eaten away at his flesh. His jaw was barely attached, moving loosely with the help of a few still-functioning ligaments. His eyes were sunken and glaring at Tina balefully. His skin was black now, covered in filth and detritus from all those years in the lake. There was still a huge gash in the middle of his forehead. He was truly a zombie. A hideous, undead creature covered in battle scars. It almost floored Tina, but it only fueled her powers more. She refocused, her eyes moving madly to the decorative ceiling lamp above Jason's head. It started to rattle, and then it exploded in a shower of sparks and glass. Jason shielded himself. Tina didn't flinch. A smirk developed on her face as she felt the full control lock into place. The wire that the lights had been hanging from moved like a snake and looped around Jason's neck, lifting him and hoisting him up high. Jason's hands tugged helplessly at the wire, but it was no use. It was moving with supernatural speed. Then Tina's eyes shifted down to the floor underneath Jason's dangling massive form. Her eyes narrowed. Come on, concentrate. She heard Dr. Cruz urging her in her mind. With the huge sound of wood splintering, a hole suddenly opened up in the floor, and then Tina's eyes rapidly flickered up to Jason and then down to the floor. The wire snapped. Jason plunged down into the cellar and landed with a hefty thud. Tina released, as more tears freely flowed down her face from all the emotions rushing through her in waves. As she composed herself, she took several deep inhales of air. Then, tiptoeing, she inched closer to the hole and peered down. A beam of light illuminated the unconscious form of Jason, sprawled on the basement floor. With a trembling hand, she gingerly touched Nick, who was lying nearby. Nick? she said. He groaned but didn't wake up. Jason suddenly pounced up out of the hole in the floor like a jack-in-the-box, grabbing Tina and pulling her and a few fragments of wood down into the cluttered and musty basement. Tina wrestled free of his grimy grasp 
and then rushed to the opposite side of the basement from Jason, scanning her surroundings for anything and everything that she could use against him. A jar of nails was sitting on a dilapidated wooden shelf. Tina intensely concentrated on it. Her face flushed red again as all of her muscles contracted. The lid to the jar unscrewed, and then the jar tipped over on its side. Nails shot out like tiny missiles at Jason. One pierced his head right between his eyes. He staggered backwards. Ripping the nail from his rotted flesh, Jason let out another ragged breath. It hadn't hurt him. He barely felt a thing. It was nothing more than an annoyance. Tina's eyes flickered over to a canister of gasoline covered in cobwebs. Without moving a muscle, Tina glared at the canister until it started to shift across the floor, and then the hose inside snaked out of the container and began to spray Jason in the concrete floor with gasoline. Then she turned to stare at the furnace as the metal door flew open on its hinges. Fire roared out of the furnace as a ring of fire rose around Jason, separating him from Tina. The fire slowly crept up Jason's leg, which had been splattered with the gas. Tina looked and saw that her jacket had been spritzed with the gas, and thinking fast, she tore it off of her, tossing it aside. Jason was fully lit ablaze now, flailing around and grasping at nothing, the intense heat overtaking him. Nick suddenly appeared at the basement steps, ushering for Tina to follow him. Jason growled as the flames swallowed him whole, and then he fell onto his knees, grasping at the sky, in complete and utter bewilderment at what was happening. Tina couldn't tear her eyes from the smoldering form of Jason. Nick finally snapped her out of it and tugged her up the stairs. Tina and Nick ran as the house quickly began to engulf in flames. The overpowering heat almost knocked them to their feet when they reached the first floor. The fire was spreading immeasurably quickly. Come on, Nick urged, and pulled Tina out the front door, just as shards of woods began to fall above their heads. The house was coming down. Tina and Nick sprinted for the lake and ran onto the dock. Hit the deck, Nick cried urgently. They dove to their knees as the shepherd home was destroyed in one fiery explosion. Chapter 10 Epilogue The boom from the explosion rocked the earth. The smoldering ashes of the shepherd home lit up the forest and the night sky. Tina and Nick uncovered their heads as the debris settled, and Tina looked in astonishment at the charred remnants of her childhood home. Tears spilled down her face, and she fell into Nick's warm embrace. It's all gone, she sobbed with absolute despair. Everything's gone. Shh, Nick consoled her, stroking her hair and holding her tightly. After a few quiet moments, neither of them heard the slow and stealthy footfalls across the wood of the pier. A hand shot out of nowhere. Tina was snatched fiercely. Nick's jaw dropped as he looked up to see Jason's singed, monstrous form, smoke still rising off his body. He tossed Tina across the pier like a rag doll. Hey, Nick bellowed. He whipped out Tina's father's pistol and aimed it at Jason, firing. A bullet nicked Jason's arm and he spun around. Nick grimaced with terror as he saw what had been underneath the hockey mask. He held strong and fired again. Another bullet tore into Jason's chest. He kept advancing like a tank towards Nick. Nick fired again and a bullet pierced Jason's left shoulder. Nick pulled the trigger again, click. 
Nick's heart skipped a beat. Out of bullets. Jason shoved Nick hard, and he went plunging into a canoe. Then he focused on Tina, the one who had caused him the most pain thus far. Tina was lying on the dock, staring up at Jason helplessly. She closed her eyes tightly, focusing all of her emotions on the masked beast. Daddy, I need you, Tina thought. Daddy, please. The lake began to churn, just like the emotions broiling inside of Tina. Clouds rolled across the sky, not obscuring the full moon. The same mysterious white fog slowly began to materialize, slinking across the surface of the water. Bubbles rose and cut through the smooth, still surface of the lake, and soon the entire area of the lake was violently churning, as if it were in the middle of a monsoon. The wind picked up, howling around them. Thunder crashed. Boards of the pier suddenly snapped, splintering like balsa wood. Rising up from the lake and smashing up through the wooden slats was the rotting specter of John Shepard, lunging out grotesquely from the gaping hole in the dock with a splash. His face was hideously decomposed. Patches of his skin had rotted off, showing the bone beneath. His hands held a rusted chain. He let out a battle cry. Tina watched in sheer awe as the decomposing figure of John Shepard sunk his bony fingers into the back of Jason's legs, sending him to his knees. John Shepard wrapped the chain around Jason's neck and yanked him backwards into the hole. Jason and the resurrected corpse of her father both disappeared underneath the surface of the water. Tina felt everything fading, and from sheer exhaustion, she passed out and everything went black. Tina's eyes fluttered open to the side of a crystal blue cloudless sky. Her vision became cloudy at first, and then her eyes cleared. There was nothing but the faint sounds of sirens in the distance and birds chirping all around her. It was morning. At first, Tina didn't move or say a thing. She was paralyzed with the realization that the last week hadn't been a dream. As she took a breath, she could still smell the smoky odor of the remains of her childhood home. It was all real. It all really happened. Jason Voorhees had risen from the depths and murdered her mother. And then, she had to battle him with powers that she wasn't too skilled at wielding. And now she was overcome with the heavy realization that she would have to explain all of it to the police. And that likely, they would not believe her. She'd probably wind up back in the hospital. But Tina was beginning to look forward to that notion. Four white walls and no Jason. Tina suddenly was snapped out of her thoughts when she felt herself being lifted by two burly men in medic uniforms. Nick! Tina suddenly cried. Where's Nick? He's all right, said one of the medics, as they strapped her into a gurney. Tina glanced around as her eyes adjusted to the sunlight even more. She saw the burning remains of her home, and she stared blankly at it. All she could do was disassociate. It was really all gone. But Tina didn't feel a thing. Her emotions were completely exhausted. She was virtually numb, and that was probably a good thing. Firefighters were spraying off the smoldering ruins. Police cars were everywhere. Tina rolled past a fireman picking up a broken and weathered hockey mask. Tina was wheeled across the clearing and rolled into an ambulance beside Nick. Where, where's Jason? Nick asked groggily. Tina stared out at the lake, which was as still and peaceful as ever, as if nothing had happened. And then she smiled knowingly, taking one last look at the lake, and then spoke up. We took care of him.
the end. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been the conclusion, chapters 9 and 10, slash epilogue, of Friday the 13th, part 7, The New Blood. The fan, you know what, no. The novelization by Landon Turner. I uh, really enjoyed the way he took this story home. Uh, I've always wondered what the hell was Melissa doing in Tina's bathroom, and why did nobody question that? You know, in my opinion, she was either pulling off a double-decker, some of you know what that is, or she was, like, flushing rags and stuff down the toilet to prank her and, like, get water everywhere. I don't know. Give me your theories in the description below. It's probably something more likely that she wanted a hot shower and Eddie had used up all the hot water after the power went out. I don't know. But why do you all think that... that what, was t what, was, what was Melissa doing in Tina's bathroom, in Tina's house? That little aside aside, um, yeah, it was a great, great ending to the book. I think Landon really knocked this one out of the park. And I really hope, Landon, that you will give Friday the 13th Part 8 a try. It is right, right above Part 3. It's my least favorite, almost least favorite of the entire series. But I feel like you could make it enjoyable. I think that you could pull a Jake Martin where he wrote the novelization to uh, Halloween 5 and made it very enjoyable. So I'd love to see what you did with Part 8. If you would give us some of the stuff that the script originally called for. You know, like Madison Square Garden, Statue of Liberty, maybe less time on the boat, more time in New York. Uh, I think I speak for everybody here on the channel, all the listeners, saying we would love to hear your take on Jason Takes Manhattan. But yeah... Dr. Cruz meeting his fate couldn't happen quick enough. Um, thank you for making it very detailed. Uh, <laughs> um, finding out that Jason propped all these people up everywhere, all these dead bodies. Like, I still wonder why he does that. Because he does that in more than just one of the movies. Like, it's almost like the Saw endings with the big reveal. You know, with the music playing and you see all the stuff that had gone down but leading up to the ending. Jason sets these bodies up and somebody always finds them. Like, what is up with this theatrical flair that that uh, Jason has for, uh, you know, showcasing his victims? <laughs> like, putting a head in a plant, putting somebody in a tree, hanging somebody from a tree, you know? He could have just left that one body in the lake. But, uh, anyways. Great job. Melissa dying just in shock. You know, not being able to scream or anything. Always enjoyed that. And, of course, the battle scenes between Tina and Jason... Written perfectly, chef's kiss. Um, I hope I was able to give a good ambiance and music and all that to really just bring home how good Landon's writing was, uh, putting us in those moments. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I just read the whole thing. I don't know what else to say. The fights were great. Uh, I don't have to go into detail about him again. Uh, he really put us there. But the thing that wins it for me that Landon gets the award for awesome fucking novelization was he gave us the decomposed corpse of John Shepard. Not the dirty-faced, algae in his hair, John Shepard. You know, sticking his bony corpse fingers into Jason's leg and bringing him down to his knees and dragging him into the lake. You know, and getting into Tina's head about, um... She knows the cops aren't going to believe her. Who the fuck would? But... Yeah, really cool shit. Really love that. Uh, love the fact that during the battles, Tina heard Dr. Cruz's voice talking to her. Even though he was a piece of shit that got her mom killed, he still, in his uh, narcissism and manipulation of Tina, he still helped her harness those powers. And to know that Jason was irritated and enraged that things weren't normal the way he saw the world working, that what she was doing was against the norm and pissing him off. Just, wow. Great job, Landon. Please, everybody listening, let me know and let Landon know what you thought of this book. Please give him a big thank you for taking the time to write this for us because uh, I think he did an amazing job. Uh, his, his novelizations of Part 4, 5, and 7 have been some of the most fun I've ever had on this channel. And I really, and I really hope that he writes Part 8 
I'm looking forward to narrating it if he does. Love his work, and uh, so thankful for Landon and what he's taking the time to do for the uh, Friday the 13th community. Um, yeah, so this has been book number 70, I think. 69 or 70, I'll have to count again. But we're trucking along. We've got some great stuff coming up in the future. Keep listening. More Slasher Mayhem on the way. More books being added to the library all the time. Thank you so much. Please consider joining our Patreon, making a PayPal or Cash App donation, or ordering a Cameo video. All the information to do those things is in the description below. We really need you guys to consider this. It's the only way we can fund the channel to keep it going and growing for years to come. Um, we can't monetize the channel on YouTube because of the content. So please, if you've ever thought about doing it, please uh, consider doing it now. We'd really appreciate it. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying, Thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. And remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. We'll see you soon.